We're talking about rest this morning, and I was tempted to just have a bed on stage the whole time <laughs> and just like be in it the whole time we're together and just roll out when it was time to preach, pajamas and everything. I got vetoed. I don't know why. Good morning. Welcome. I'm glad you're here. Uh, for those of you that don't know me, my name's Travis, and uh, I'm the single adults minister here at Park Cities, and so if you're a single adult, there is a place for you uh, with us. would love for you to join us at some time. Uh, we meet at 915 over in the Coral Hall, and uh, what I did concurrently with my job here at Park Cities, uh, I was in the United States Army Reserve. I was an Army chaplain. Uh, I was in the Army for about eight years. I was a chaplain for about three of those years, and uh, it was, it was intense, and it wasn't intense for uh, the reasons you might think. Uh, it was intense because I had to do a lot of traveling. So I was part of a, a drill sergeant unit, and we had a lot of units spread out all over the place. And yes, that was super intimidating to just be around drill sergeants all the time. I always felt like I was doing something wrong. Um, and, and so uh, my, my wife and I would kind of road trip. We'd go to, to Norman, Oklahoma. We'd go to Lawton. I had units in uh, Round Rock, uh, South Padre Island. Uh, Monroe, Louisiana, all the way up to Lincoln, Nebraska. And I would kind of make the tour. I would go on the road, and, and, and every month I would be kind of in a different place. And as we, we went through this season, uh, initially I was part-time here at Park Cities. Then I became full-time while still doing uh, that thing. And what we realized was that pretty much every weekend, if I wasn't doing something here for the church, I was doing something with the Army. And we began to ask ourselves, how long can we keep this up? It's exhausting. We're getting worn down. And praise the Lord, I who am not administratively gifted, for whatever reason, I was checking my Army Human Resources record, again, for whatever reason, and I realized that I could actually transition out of the Army the following spring. We began to pray about that and realized that, the, yes, we need to do that. And the big drive, the big motivator behind it was we can't rest we don't feel like we're getting rest, and because of that, we don't feel like we're being very effective either doing ministry in the Army or here at Park Cities. We felt pulled in two different places. I don't know where you're at today, but if you're an average American, you don't rest well. You're worn down. You're tired. And my guess is you probably come to church on Sunday morning expecting some measure of encouragement and an uplifting message because you're so tired. Some of you are going to yawn while I'm talking, and that's okay. I forgive you. I've had people sleep before. Just figure my, my voice is soothing. <laughs> but you've got to ask yourself, I want you to look at your life, and I want you to take a hard look at your life this morning. We're going to talk about rest, but hopefully the morning won't be too restful, because you need to look, take a hard look at your life and ask yourself, how long can we keep this up? How long can we keep living at the pace we're going to live? Because if you're like us, you're worn down, you're tired, and you need a break. So that's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about how we can find a pattern of rest in our lives. We're going to be in Mark chapter 2, verse 23. So if you have a Bible, uh, turn with us there. And it's going to be a, a little bit of a different uh, discussion this morning. I'm hoping uh, to be very practical uh, and, and help you really evaluate how you might have time of rest. Now, a little bit of a disclaimer, I will use the word Sabbath some, and the word Sabbath is just the Jewish word for uh, the, their day of rest. I'll use that some, but I want to try and stray a little bit away from the concept of Sabbath as much as we can, because that is the biblical concept of rest, so that we don't tie it and lock it down to one day. I'll probably stray and use the word Sunday some, one that wasn't the Jewish understanding of Sabbath, theirs was Saturday, ours is Sunday. But for most of you, Sunday is going to be the day off for you. That's, that's when it fits in your schedule. Others of you, if you're listening to this at some point later on, today might be a special day. Sunday might not be the day that you can rest best. So a couple of disclaimers there. We're looking at our history of struggle with rest, some practical things we can do, and then what God has done for us. Our history of rest can be summed up in about four words. We don't rest well. We don't rest well. And I think there are reasons why we don't rest well. I think the first is we don't like the discipline that rest requires. We don't like the discipline that rest requires. In our twisted view of work, 
we view rest as doing nothing, as ceasing from doing anything. So when I talk about taking a break or resting, you picture staring off into space in a room that nothing's going on in it. You're bored. That's what you think rest looks like. But Abraham Heschel, who's kind of the Jewish, uh, was the Jewish guru on Sabbath rest, says six days a week we seek to dominate the world, and on the seventh day we try to dominate the self. And isn't that what discipline is? It's trying to dominate or control yourself. So in order to rest, we have to be disciplined at it. It has to be a practice in our lives. And in order for something to have a discipline, it has to have order. It has to have order. Even the most type B person in the room can't rest in the midst of absolute chaos. Anarchy is not helpful for anyone to rest. When I was in seminary, uh, we would have to write fairly long papers. And before I could sit down to actually work on anything significant, I had to clean my apartment. Now, my roommates loved this because they knew whenever I had a paper due, they were like, oh, Travis is going to clean. This is great. Clean bathrooms, everything. But that's how I had to get ready. Everything had to be ordered in order for my mind to engage. And maybe some of you are like that, where everything has to be put in its place and the people around you are somewhat tortured by this. But anarchy doesn't lead to rest. Order leads to the ability to rest, and it leads to the discipline and rest. In fact, the very first example of anyone resting in Scripture at all is in Genesis chapter 2, verses 2 and 3. And it's God himself who has just organized creation. He's created, and now he's resting. And when God creates, he creates out of nothing. It's called ex nihilo. He creates out of nothing, but he doesn't just throw things on planet Earth and was like, figure out where you're going to go. He takes the fish and he puts them in the water. He takes the birds and he puts them in the air. He takes the animals, the other animals, and puts them on the land. The water stays in one spot, the land stays in another. God doesn't just create, he orders it. He organizes it. He files it. And then he rests. He takes a break. So there's order, 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 rest. Order, 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 rest. And it's a rhythm. It's like a good song. It's like good music. Music has a beat to it. Some of you have taken out the rests out of your life, the rhythm of rest, and it just sounds like kids playing on drums. And that's why it's chaotic. We don't like to rest because we don't like the discipline that it requires. We don't like to rest because we don't also like to take the time to rest. We don't like to take time to rest. The Sabbath, the Jewish day of rest, became a trademark of Jewish culture. They were known for resting on the seventh day of the week, on Saturday. And it was vitally important, so vitally important, that they rested every six days that it became one of the top ten commandments that God gave them. He said, you will do this. But it wasn't just that they rested one day a week. They were also supposed to rest one year out of 50. It was called the year of Jubilee. And every 50 years, everybody would take the whole year off. My workaholics in here are like cringing. You're like, Ugh. A whole year off. You can't fathom taking a, a day off from work, much less a, less a year. Well, I've got good news. The Israelites couldn't figure it out either. Do you know how many times they actually did a year of Jubilee? Starts with a Z and ends with an Eero. <laughs> they never did it. And so when God says, look, I'm tired of the idolatry, I'm tired of the fact that you're not obeying my commandments, I'm sending you into exile into Babylon, and you're going to be there for 70 years. Do you know why I picked 70? It's not an arbitrary number that God was like, mm, I like the number seven, let's just go with that. It's the number of years that they missed doing the year of Jubilee. The nation of Israel essentially gets put into time out for 70 years because they weren't doing what they were supposed to do for 70 years. We also are the same way. We don't like taking the time to rest. We don't like the discipline, and we don't like the time it takes. There's other things we think we could be doing, better things. And God says, no, there's not better things. We also don't understand God's intention for rest. Look at Mark chapter 2, verse 23. One Sabbath, he, who's he? It's Jesus. He was going through the grain fields, and as they made their way, his disciples began to pluck heads of grain. And the Pharisees were saying to him, look, why are they doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath? So remember, the Israelites got uh, removed from the land because they weren't keeping their commandments. 
So what the Pharisees had done is they had created, they didn't want to break the law of God, so they created a system of man-made rules that if you broke those, then you would be close to breaking the law of God. Right? So it's called a fence. They actually, the, the Jewish word for it, is, it means fence. They put a fence around the law so you can't break it, so they can't be punished for it. And this leads to a wonderful word that we still use today called legalism. The Pharisees are losing their minds over one thing that the, the disciples are doing. And there were all sorts of rules about the Sabbath that you couldn't do. You couldn't go on a journey. Now, what's a journey? A journey is anything more than 3,000 steps. So they would have loved Fitbit. <laughs> got my Sabbath count going. I'm at 12, 1,500. I've got to take a break. You also couldn't uh, fix a house that had fallen in. So if your house collapsed on you, let's say a tree branch falls in the midst of a storm, house collapse, you can't fix it. You can't start work on it on the Sabbath. It, you can do a little bit of work to see if anybody is hurt or dead. If they're hurt, you can get them out and begin to treat them. But if they're dead, you have to leave them there for the next day. That is how legalistic they were. And they would have arguments on it. Some more conservative groups would say you can't pick up a child on the Sabbath or that's work. I, my family would have a hard time with that. And the disciples are going along, and they begin to pluck heads of grain out of this field, which is legal. Jewish law allows, actually, the, the, the Torah allowed people to pick heads of grain by hand from their neighbor's field. And the Pharisees see it, and they're like, why are they working? Now, what work are they doing? They're harvesting. They're harvesting. They lose their mind. The Sabbath, God's rest, God's idea for rest had been perverted and been co-opted to be a tool of oppression, control, and insecurity. I'm glad we don't do that with anything else in our society. <laughs> it's not just rest that we do that with. Rest became something that God never intended it to be. It became a monster. And rather than resting, rather than spending your Sabbath reconnecting with the Lord and those around you, doing life-giving things, it became a day of anxiety Control and fear. Am I going to get caught doing something I shouldn't do? So we don't like rest. We don't rest well. Because we also get a little legalistic about our, our Sundays, our Sabbath days, right? We do one of two things with rest. This is the, uh, the last reason why we don't rest well. We either make it too hard or we make it too easy. We make it too hard or we make it too easy. So as we move through history, we take this idea of the Sabbath, we move it to Sunday, and why is it on the Sunday? Because Jesus rose from the dead on Sunday. We move it, which is good. And then we kind of fuse it with some, some Western culture ideas and this great thing called the Protestant work ethic. And we've got our modern day Sunday. And so we either make it way too hard or way too easy. So for some of us, we don't put any structure around rest at all, Right? So we go home, we put on our, our, our comfy pants, our give up on life pants, <laughs> we go lay on the couch, and we watch football or baseball, baseball, and we, we just lay there. And then 9, 30, 10 o'clock rolls around, and we then go to bed. And we're like, wow, great day of rest. Or we work insane hours, we work at an insane pace, and we have no scheduled day of rest. We leave vacation days on the table because that's what you're supposed to do. And then we rest finally when we either get too sick to work and no one wants to be around us or we're just exhausted and we're forced to take rest. This is called binge resting. We completely ignore God's intention for rest that he put in Genesis 2, 2 through 3 and we work 24-7 constantly available for work via text, email. It can be accessed at any time. The other extreme is to completely make it regulated so that it's not restful at all. So we might not go to a restaurant on Sunday afternoon because we're like, well, that makes other people rest or work on their day of rest. So we can't do that. Or we have these great things as a culture called blue laws where you can't buy certain things on Sunday now, why it's, it's unholy to buy something on, a, on midnight on Sunday and not at 11.59 on Saturday night, I don't understand. But there it is. Again, I'm not debating the political necessity of blue laws or the lack thereof. 
We always spend Friday or Saturday night hanging out with anyone and everyone, doing whatever it is we want to do. And we roll into church on Sunday morning for worship because that's what we're supposed to do on our day of rest. And we legalize it. Either way, rest gets divorced from God's intention because it's not based on the principles and the intent that God has for it. This happened to the Israelites. Their history is one long story of not being able to rest well. And it happens to us too because we're not very good at resting. We're Americans. We work hard. And we play hard, they say. Some of us are addicted to work. And my guess is probably more of us than we'd like to admit. We don't rest well. We don't rest well. So how do we get better? How do we do better at resting? Well, I think we need to view rest as a gift to be enjoyed. Rest is a gift to be enjoyed. And this is a gift that should do two things. It should address our needs, and it should be life-giving. It should address our needs, and it should be life-giving. So when I was a kid, I got great gifts. Like, great gifts. I got Legos. I got action figures, I got video games, I got Nerf guns. If I had to be honest with you, I would still welcome many of these gifts today. <laughs> and then I had a relative, I had some relatives, that felt like gifts needed to address a need that I had. And as a seven-year-old, I didn't understand the value of this. I would be awarded at Christmas time a sweater for all those cold days we have in Georgia. <laughs> it was 100% humidity. I'd get like, a, like a, a dresser or a desk. Now as an adult, I'm like, man, somebody coming in and giving me like a sweater, meeting my needs, like that's a great thing. I love the idea of somebody coming and meeting my needs, giving me things that I don't have to go and buy for myself. That's a blessing. But as a seven-year-old, I'm just like, I want the Legos, man. That's, that's all I want. When we begin to think about how we can enjoy the, the gift of rest, the place we need to start are our needs. We need to boil down our day to what is it that we need to do. What are the things that we absolutely have to do in order to exist on a day? Let's look at Mark 2.24. Uh, we'll see Jesus address this. He says, And the Pharisees were saying to him, Look, why are they doing what's not lawful on the Sabbath? And he said to them, Have you never read what David did? When he was in need, and he was hungry, and he and those who were with him, how he entered the house of God in the time of Abiathar the high priest, and ate the bread of the presence, which is not lawful for anyone but the priest to eat. And he also gave it to those who were with him. David has a need. He's on the run from Saul. So David gets anointed as king, which is great. There's just one problem. There's already one of those in Israel, and he doesn't want to give up the job. And so while God is working that out over time, David's on the run with, with, his, with his boys. They're, they're, they're on the run. It's like a road trip. And they get hungry. And when you're on the run from somebody who wants to kill you, you can't like, be real selective about what you eat. And so David, knowing that he is the anointed king of Israel, knowing that God has anointed him to do this, he takes a bold step. He gets the bread of the presence out of the, the tabernacle, and he eats it. He doesn't just eat it, he gives it to those that were with him. He takes care of other people's needs as well. And that is how we should look at our Sabbath. Our Sabbath day, our Sunday, our day of rest, whatever that is, should be a day to address our needs and address the needs of others as well. So when I take a time of rest, I need to think about myself and what I need and what other people need as well. So this should be a really small list. And I'm going to challenge you here, that list is smaller than you think. You need to be real judicious about what goes on this list. So for me, for instance, I have a, a, an almost two-year-old. She needs to eat or no one rests, right? So I have to feed her, which involves quite a bit of, of doing labor uh, of some kind, right? Putting together a meal, putting it before her, watching her choose whether or not she's going to eat it. Like all of this uh, is involved in that. My toddler has to eat. So some of you have children and you need to take care of them. So that's something you need to do, or you have uh, older parents that maybe you have to take care of, or a sibling or something like that. That's something that needs to be done. That's a need. That's okay. I need to be with other people. Now, that might be a surprise, but we're communal. 
As human beings, we need to be around other people. Even your most introverted person who's like, I don't need to be around anybody. Like the moment I said that, you turn, tuned out. You were gone. You were somewhere else. You need to be with other people too. It's why I think it's really good that on Sunday you're in church with other people. That can be your other people time and then you can go find a book somewhere and disappear for a day. It's great. You need to be with other people. I need sleep. I need sleep. I had a seminary professor once say, sometimes going to bed is the most godly thing you can do. (laughs) Amen and amen. (laughs) You need sleep. You got to rest. So that Sunday afternoon nap that you like, I think that's godly, baby. (laughs) Take that nap. Put on a little NASCAR or what I like to call nap car because that sound just, mm, just puts me right out, man. Things that aren't needed. This is where I'm going to step on your toes, hopefully. Most jobs don't need you 24-7. Unless you are a doctor, a fireman, a police officer, military, emergency situations, most of your jobs don't need you 24-7. You get a corporate email on Sunday, that's not a 911. Now, if somebody's going to die, that's a 911. But leave it till Monday. Let it ride. You don't need to do your grocery shopping or laundry. laundry, laundry you don't need to do your grocery shopping or your laundry on Sunday, single adults. I know how you live. There are six other days where you can do laundry and you can do grocery shopping. You don't need to do it on the day of rest. It's not a catch-up day. You don't need to clean your house or do homework. Teenagers, students, some of you wait until like Sunday at like 4 to start your, your, your homework. Don't wait. Knock it out and then spend Sunday resting, getting ready for the rest of the week. I was in high school at one point too. You also don't need to argue on Sunday. Some of you came to church this morning and are, are like in the midst of like a heated battle with someone in your family. That's like a standoff. We'll truce for church and then we're back at it in the car. There are not many arguments that need to be had that you can't take a break from for a Sunday or for a day of rest and be like, hey, let's just let this be a day of peace. I understand that that's a big issue for you. It's a big issue for me too. It grates me a little bit, but can we please just rest? Let's lay down our arms and rest, not your literal arms, and rest for a day. Some of you you students or or you have kids that you don't want to get out of bed on Sunday morning. You don't want to go to church. Sunday can be a day, your Sabbath can be a day of negotiation. Hey, this is a day where the whole family gets to choose how they're going to rest. So mom and dad, you might be able to say to your, your child, hey, look, as, we're going to rest as a family, and the way that mom and dad are choosing to rest is to go to church, and we want you to go with us. You have the afternoon to choose an activity for our family to do together. And I feel like that's a fair trade. Maybe you can choose where we go to lunch or what we do for lunch. Again, have a conversation, but you have to have a conversation about that before you get to Sunday at 8.50 when you're trying to drag so-and-so out of the bed. Got to have a little pre-gaming. You got to plan, right? The gift should address your needs, and you need to pare down what those needs are and what they aren't. And it takes a little planning. It takes a little intentionality. Now, does that mean we can't do anything other than our needs on Sunday morning or on our day of rest? No, of course not. That would make you a Pharisee. If you only did exactly what you needed to do on a Sunday or on a day of rest, that would make you a Pharisee. So the gift needs to be life-giving. Look at verse 27. And he said to them, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. Jesus drops a bomb of revelation here. In Jesus' day, the day of rest was one of the most sacred things in Jewish life. It's what made you Jewish, that and circumcision. Those were the two big things. And so every Jew was subservient to honoring the sacredness of the Sabbath day. So much so that many Jews, even today, believe that the creation of Sabbath rest is actually the crown of creation and not mankind. Whereas as Christians, I think we would mostly argue that mankind is the crown of creation. Jesus confirms that when he says the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. It's a gift to be celebrated. It's a gift that should give life. So this is how you should decide what you're going to do on your day of rest. Ask yourself this question. Does what I'm about to do 
promote or restore life? Is what I'm about to do promoting or restoring life? Some derivatives of this question might be, some clarifying questions. Is what I'm about to do drudgery or mindless or unengaging? Is what I'm about to do selfish and harmful to my relationship with other people and God? If the answer to those two questions are yes, then you shouldn't do, or then you shouldn't do them. Is what I'm about to do fruitless or toilsome? Like, I consider laundry to be toil. I have a giant mound of laundry to do, and I'm not touching it today. I got plenty of underwear. I'm good. I'm good. Is what I'm about to do rest? Or is it just leisure? Now, I want to address something real quick. Rest is not leisure. And we often get those two confused. I want you to think to your family room or your living room at home. What is every piece of furniture organized around? Probably looks like one of these. It's a TV. TVs are great. Again, I watch a lot of baseball. I love TVs. Rest is not leisure. Andy Crouch, who wrote a great book called The TechWise Family. It's a short read. Uh, Everybody should read it. It's excellent. He says, if toil is fruitless labor, you should think of leisure as fruitless escape from labor. It's a kind of rest that doesn't really restore our souls, doesn't restore our relationships with others or with God. He says, your homes are designed around leisure. We're designed around TVs, screens, even to some extent TV dinners, things that are easy to put together, not things that are restoring or life-giving. So how do I choose things that are life-giving? Here's a step-by-step process. One, turn off your screens. Turn off your screens. TV, iPad, phone. You don't have to turn them off completely. I understand that's many of our lifelines out to the world. I get that. But stop looking at them. Put them somewhere in the house and be like, we're not touching this today. Our TV gets a day of rest too. It gets a day off. Turn them off. Don't organize your day around it. Two, find something life-giving to do with yourself or with other people. Probably a mixture of both. So here's some things. Go outside. Take a walk. Go for a run. Breathe air that's not circulated through a vent. (laughs) Practice creative arts. Things like painting, cooking, music. I don't care if you're bad at them. Try them. On, uh, on Friday, I have, it's just me and Hattie hanging out, and uh, we got some colored pencils down, and so we're coloring, and I can honestly say the most therapeutic thing I've done in a long time is, is draw an underwater ocean scene with colored pencils with my daughter, uh, and she's just sitting there coloring away too. It's a lot of fun. It's amazingly therapeutic just to kind of rest. Read a book. Read a novel. Read to one another. That was like all the rage for most of history, by the way, reading to each other. Now we we do that separately. Read to each other. Take different parts. Step three, at the end of your day, take a deep breath and remember and reflect on it, thanking God for all he's blessed you with. Basically do something that you'll look back and you'll say, I'm glad we did that together. And then do it every single week. You're going to go home and you're going to try this and you're going to feel like it doesn't work. But it's going to work because you need to put it into practice. You need to do it regularly. It's only going to work if it keeps happening over time. One day of rest out of like 365 doesn't work. You've got to do it again and again and again. You've got to be a pattern and a discipline about it. And then the last thing we need to do, this is the most important thing you need to do in order to rest. Rest must be placed in Christ. Your rest must be placed in Christ. I have a really hard time sleeping away from home. When I go to a hotel or I go to someplace different, like a family's house, I've got to try and look at the bed and figure out, okay, which side of the bed do I sleep on that mirrors my side of the bed back home? The answer is it's it's always the other side because I never sleep on the right side. And so I, I, I identify sleep and rest so much with a place. I desperately want to sleep, and I can't sleep unless I'm home because I've identified sleep with a place. We need to take the idea of sleep, the the way that I identify it with a place, and we need to put it in the place of a person. I can't rest unless I have the person and work of Jesus Christ in my life, unless my rest is fully focused on him. As followers of Jesus, it's important for us to do that. Why is this important? Because it takes the focus of resting off of me, and it turns it into an act of worship. The Bible repeatedly makes 
rest, properly oriented towards God, an act of worship. We have the only religious tradition, us, us, the Judeo-Christian tradition, is the only one that has a high holy day where you don't do something. Every other religion on a high holy day, you, you have acts, the things you have to do, you have to do, you have to do. Our God is so confident, so secure in who he is, he's like, yeah, take a day off, and that'll honor me too. And we're like, no, nah, I don't want to do it. I, I'm in charge of me. I'm, I'm going to take care of this, God. I don't need the break. I'll just keep working. And God's like, then you're not going to keep worshiping because you will rest. You will. Because when I truly put my rest in him, it shows that I actually trust him. You're going to go to sleep tonight, and you're not going to be conscious. You're, you're just going to be out of it. Who do you think watches over you while you sleep? Is that multi-hundred dollar alarm system you've got in your house? Is the locks on your door? No, it's the Lord. Because you're unconscious. Sleeping is a confession that God is in control and I am not. It's a confession that I am not God at all. And resting one day a week is the same. If you can't rest, if you can't stop striving, if you can't take a half day off from getting after it, you can't really describe your life as one of faith. I'm not saying you're not a Christian. I'm just saying that there is something about the way you do your life that is telling God that he is not enough and you've got to take a little bit of control back from him. And if you can't depend on God, then you can't really rest. Because our rest comes in the form of a person. That's what the story of the gospel is. The gospel is a story of how to give people rest. How do we get them to quit from working and trying to earn God's favor? How do we fix this problem that man has dug themselves into? God asked himself, how do I give this rest to a people that seemingly won't take it? Look at Hebrews 4, 9 through 11. We'll be brief here. 9 through 11 says this, So then there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For whoever has entered God's rest has also rested from his works as God did from his. Let us therefore strive to enter the rest so that no one may fall by the same sort of disobedience. The writer of Hebrews describes an eternal relationship with God through his son Jesus Christ as rest, as peace. I don't know about you, but that sounds nice. If you want to have real rest, eternal rest, and rest that starts today, you need to put your faith in Jesus Christ. Because he did all the work. The gospel is rooted in the fact that Christ did everything, and we have rest if we believe in him. The Son of God did work by becoming a man. He put on the incarnation. He put on flesh, and he dwelt amongst men. And you know what we did for that? We rested. He worked by living a perfect, God-honoring life. And you know what we did? We rested. He worked by suffering and dying on the cross on our behalf. And do you know what we did? We rested. And he was raised to life, showing that his sacrifice was accepted. And do you know what we can do today? We can rest. You can rest. Six days shall you labor, and the seventh is the Lord's. You will never truly rest apart from Christ. You will always be trying to prove yourself to God. You'll always be trying to earn it. You'll always be trying to make something better, and you'll never rest truly in your heart. So my hope for you today is if you don't know who Jesus Christ is, that you will put your rest and trust in him today. We're over in the next steps room right outside these doors, north side over here. You can come hang out with us over there and just talk to us about it. Tell me that you can't keep going. Tell someone else. Go over there and rest with us just for a little bit. Sometimes sharing about what you're going through is rest. Maybe some of you have known Christ for a while, but you're not putting your faith in him by resting. You drive your family as hard as you drive yourself. Take a break. Rest. We're not good at resting. We're really bad at it. And the only way we're going to get better is if we practice. But that practice has to start 
by regularly, not just on a s- one day a week, but every day of the week, turning to the Lord and confessing that we rest in Him and we look forward to implementing a pattern of rest in our lives. Rest is a gift. And it's a gift that you can take today. But you're a fool if you leave it on the table. Don't be a fool. Put your trust and your rest in Christ. And rest from your labors. Let's pray. Gracious God and Heavenly Father, you have blessed us with the gift of rest. That, Lord, we can lay aside the things that we have striven for, the things that we've uh, drive for, the things that we We can lay all that aside, Lord God, because you tell us at the end of Mark chapter 2, you say, the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. You've given us the gift of rest, and I pray that we would take it today. I pray that we would not think we have to continue to work because we don't. You have given us everything we need. You've given us everything we need for salvation. And so, God, I pray that we would take that gift today. And we ask all this in the name of your Son, the Lord of the Sabbath. Amen. Thank you for taking time to watch this sermon. If you would like more information about our church or following Jesus, please go to our website, pcbc.org, or contact our church offices. We hope to see you next week at church.